afternoon. Well, of course, the main reason we saw such devastating floods in Durban last week was the simple fact that so much water fell out of the sky. But there are other questions around drainage systems and the ground on which the rain fell. In other words, if the ground had been able to drain more easily, perhaps there would have been less flooding. If people had not built on areas that get flooded easily, perhaps it would have been easier to save lives during the flooding as well. Well, Keval Singh is an associate in geotechnical engineering at JG Africa. Uh, he joins us now. Keval, good afternoon to you. Uh, when we talk about drainage systems, my first thought is that we're talking about storm water drains. You see them in pavements, they often have plastic blocking them up. Is that what we're talking about? How important is it to maintain those? Well, good afternoon, uh, Stephen, and good afternoon to the viewers. Um, yeah, I mean, drainage in itself encompasses, obviously, the built environment which we have in terms of our storm water systems that drain our roads and um, diversion channels and those sort of things. But drainage is also just the natural permeability of the subsoils and the rate at which water flows in different material. So, in other words, there are some areas where water will drain very easily and there are some areas where it will just build up very quickly. Correct, yeah, and that's all just due primarily to the geological conditions underlaying those areas affected by the recent flooding as well. So, I mean, some areas, and I mean, you can see this anywhere, some areas are rocky, they have harder soil. I presume that absorbs less water than areas that have softer soil. Yeah, so typically our, our sandier soils or gravelly soils, particularly on the coastal areas of KZN, where we have what we call quaternary soils, which is a mixture of um, mainly fine to medium sands, which will drain quite easily, whereas our clayey sands or silky sands would take quite a long time to, to drain and dissipate what we call poor water pressures, which build up in the land. Can we tell, I mean, we can tell in advance what will happen, right? I mean, people like you will know. We, I suppose you can probably just walk in an area and you'll be able to know how that area will drain. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the real issue often is um, before, before township planning and development of land, essentially a geotechnical investigation should be undertaken on that parcel of land where at a preliminary phase we identify if the land is suitable for development. And that being said, we consider all factors, the groundwater, the drainage of the site, the slope stability, and the engineering geological properties of the subsoil material. And that, all of that is taken into account prior to signing of areas being feasible for development or not. Um, I would have thought, and I'm not an engineer, but I would have thought that often it would make more sense to build in an area with a hard soil, almost with rock, because you know that's going to be stable. On a soft soil, you don't have that stability. And yet, from what you're saying, a soft soil might be safer in an area that gets a lot of rain. Yeah, I mean, all areas are, I mean, on the sites need to be assessed on a site-specific basis in terms of stability for founding structures. But, I mean, it's, it's immaterial if there's rock or soil an area can be developed. I mean, we have ground improvement techniques to, to mitigate uh, on, on those sort of issues. Just for instance, people would have seen the, the, the foundations exposed in some of the houses in Amshroti area where we've got piles that have been founded in the, the quaternary sands or, or as, as what people see as the beach sands. And I mean, in those sort of soils, we've got quite good um, ground improvement techniques to hold um, houses in those sort of areas. Um, so would we have to then sort of work on exclusion zones to properly look at the soil, do what's the phrase, a geotechnical investigation and actually say in these areas people should not build? Yeah, so as I said, um, it's imperative that all these sites be assessed on a site-specific basis and where we have the large-scale landslides and mudslides and earth failures we'll need to assess again the soil conditions the geological conditions groundwater conditions and specifically where we have slope stability issues conduct slope stability analysis to determine if the area is perceived to be in an imminent risk of failure or future failures to occur i mean in in, in instances where we have river 
rivers bursting its banks and large scale flooding, it might be the case where we need to conduct flood line assessments to determine the risk of future floods if those areas are to be developed. And that being said, this will assist in town planning and, de and developing building exclusion zones for future planning purposes. Um, does the soil also change? So where I'm going to with this is, for example, we've had a really intense flooding, so a lot of water went into some of these areas. Does that change the nature of the soil? Over time, could it change? Could it, uh, you know, be safe, or could it have been safe in the 1980s to build in an area, but it's not safe now? Could an area where it's not safe now become safer later? Um, what happens over time from a geological point of view is that we have a process of soil formation where rock slowly weathers to what we call residual soil, which slowly weathers, weathers to some of the, the soils we see in present time. And this happens over a period of geological time. So we're talking about tens of millions of years. So within the period that we're talking from, say, 19, if, we, if we're looking at floods specifically from the 1987 floods to the present day and age, the material wouldn't have varied that much since then. But what happens when we receive unprecedented rainfall is we get a lot of groundwater infiltration. So meaning with the, with, with the unprecedented rainfall, the groundwater table rises. And when the groundwater table rises, it saturates the subsurface material. And when that material is saturated, it's in, it's in a very um, um, weak state, meaning it's, it's, it's very fluid and can easily be, um, it can easily be upset if the resisting forces are not enough to retain it. That, and that comes down to the soil mechanics and the groundwater regime in certain areas. And that being said, what, when it comes to slope stability, it's a combination of issues. It's, it, it's, it, it's um, reliant on the loads imposed in the soil. So that means the intent, it would relate to the intensity of development in a given area. It relates to the surface and subsurface drainage of the area. It relates to the geological conditions. Certain areas are predisposed to, to bad soil conditions. And it's, it's a well-known um, well fact that some of our inherent mass wasting soils, uh, which is landslide debris, is unstable for development. So there's a combination of factors that result in progressive mass wasting and moving off the soils, which is only compounded in a state of flooding where we've got the saturated um, groundwater conditions due to rapid groundwater rising. Um, when you build in an area, does that also increase the chance of flooding? So but just by building, you obviously change what's happening on the surface. Uh, that may well change the nature and also just change the entire sort of floodplain. I mean, often people will level an area before they build. That must increase the chances of flooding. Um, yeah, I mean, when an area is developed in, in any given state, what, what we have, we've got more hard pan areas, meaning there's larger surface areas from which surface water would flow off and there's less um, capacity for it to infiltrate naturally into the ground and for it to absorb. So from that perspective, um, intensity of development more it, it contributes to concentrating the flow to certain areas rather than letting the a natural inherently le letting natural processes absorb the the, the the rainfall that comes through so it's more of a condition of concentrated groundwater flow condition condition uh, uh, concentrated surface water flow conditions that need to be accommodated for, to prevent any flooding um, so what, what all of this leads to is there are certain areas where people may have built in the past where they shouldn't build now. Um, and this is, I mean, I can just imagine the arguments, Kavala, I can imagine lawyers consulting people like you in cases like this, because people will often want to build in a particular place. And you've got to tell them that they can't, even though the ground looks okay. Uh, this is going to lead to a very difficult dynamic. Yes, it's... it's it's a contentious issue. I mean, um, developable and stable ground conditions is fast becoming limited in KZN. And we've got a lot of encroachment occurring in marginally developable land per se. And uh, it's often not the most stable or, or the best land to develop on. 
And I mean, from a scientific point of view, if the area is considered unstable from a geotechnical point of view in terms of the soil conditions, stability, settlement, and um, those sort of issues, this compounds to, the, to, to houses cracking, falling, and having long-term problems. That being said, if these um, particular developments also lie within a floodplain off, off, off a river course, um, it poses a risk to, to those settlements from the outset for the risk of flooding during just normal um, seasonal rainfall events. Okay, well, so, I mean, those areas, yeah, those areas typically get characterized as development exclusion zones, but there's, there's often the, the, the push that um, we have to find more developable land. In the end, I think we're going to have to go up, aren't we? We're going to have to build more blocks of flats in that area. Kaval Singh, thank you. An associate for geotechnical engineering at JG Africa. It's fascinating.